Hello, I'm Ariel Kroon. And I'm Christina Della Rocha. Welcome to Season 4 of Solarpunk Presence, the podcast introducing you to the people working today to create a future we'd like to live in. Because if solarpunk as a genre of fiction dreams about the just and sustainable world we'd like to live in in the future, solarpunk as a movement rolls up its sleeves and gets down to the business of bringing it about in the present. We hope you enjoy this episode, but first, we need your support. Come join our Patreon at patreon.com slash solarpunkpresence for all sorts of good stuff like bonus clips, dispatches, photo essays, and early access to episodes. Or you can spread the word by writing our podcast a review or recommending us to a friend, or you can do both. And be sure to visit our beautiful new website and catch up on our blog at solarpunkpresence.com. And now, on to the episode. Welcome to episode two of season four of Solarpunk Presence. One of Solarpunk's central questions is how should we live with each other in the future? One of the many possible answers is in co-housing. And co-housing is where you have an intentional community of privately owned, you know, they could be houses or condos or apartments, arranged around a shared space and events that foster interactions and cooperation between neighbors. Today's discussion is with a resident of just such a co-housing community or situation, um, and hopefully she can give us a bit of an introduction to the ups and downs of co-housing, or, you know, because this is solar punk, let's talk about the ups and ups. Here it is. Today, I'm discussing housing alternatives with Hermina Yoldersma, who moved into the cooperative home that I used to live in it back in Edmonton and was living there for a time. Hermina has a lot of experience living in different housing situations in Canada and internationally, and I'm excited to have the chance to talk with her now. Hermina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if, just to start off, you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do and where you're located now. I'm currently located in Edmonton, Alberta. I just turned 70. I haven't always lived in Edmonton. I moved to Edmonton relatively recently. In fact, last summer permanently. Before that, I have lived in many different places. I was a German professor teaching and administration. I did most of that at the University of Calgary, but I also taught at the University of Manitoba and at a college in Michigan. So I've kind of been around. I am also a passionate fiber person, fiber artist, you might say. I've uh, sewn things since I was 13. And between the academic world and the fiber world, I have done many, many, many adventurous things. And I continue to do them here in um, in Edmonton, I've I've joined groups already, and I've I'm part of the costuming scene. Uh, I just yesterday I got an assignment to make a dryad a dryad costume for the Narnia play that's happening in Sherwood Park in December. It's lots of fun, and you meet people, and it's just great fun. Okay, now I want to ask you all about that, but <laughs> well, stick to housing. <laughs> Uh, I want to pick your brain about the different types of housing that you've lived in during your adventures. And I would love it if you could share some of your experiences with different forms of housing. So both in Canada and internationally, if you're comfortable. Yeah. I lived in Calgary until 2012. And in 2010, my beloved second husband passed away and left a great big hole in my life. So at the time I did some stock taking. Um, I, I got a book, actually, created a little uh, notebook that I still still have and use called um, Minnie's Odyssey. Uh, I have, have been called Minnie for a great portion of my life as well. And one of the things I did in that book was take stock of all the places that I had ever lived in my life. And it turns out that um, I've lived on a farm, in a single house, in a duplex, in three different university dorms, in a number of shared houses and roommate situations, in my own apartment, my own condo. I have had a few house sitting gigs, a few short term furnished rentals. Uh, I've spent a month at a nunnery. And I did that probably in around 20 different cities in five countries and within Canada in six provinces and a territory. So I have really lived 
in many, 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 many different situations over my life. In fact, it's a staggering number. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but <laughs> that's kind of the way my life went. Um, we left, I lived on a farm till I was 10. And when I was 10, we moved to the city to Hamilton. And when I was 13, my father was killed in a work accident. And I think those two factors have influenced my life vastly, greatly, and also my housing choices. I think that um, I love the farm and I love my dad. And with those two gone, I came became kind of rootless and restless and probably depressed underground. I'm a very high functioning depressive. It's quite amazing how much I've achieved despite it all. <laughs> but I think it has also made me move many, many times and seek different adventures and and do different things. So yes, I've had a great deal of experience with all kinds of different housing types in different different places. Did you know much about what a cooperative housing community would be like before uh, you moved into one and sort of what was the most surprising thing to you? So I'll make a, a distinction between co-op housing and co-housing because oh. we are going to talk about co-housing in a minute. Cooperative housing is what I lived with, it lived in, as you did, in the same in the same house. In fact, I think I, I have the, had the same bedroom that you had after you. Yeah. Um, and uh, a co-op house is, a co-op is, is, is a shared uh, physical space with some nod towards community. Whereas co-housing is a shared community with an effort to create a shared physical space. So I think the two are kind of opposite in that way. I had, of course, known about Inroads co-housing forever, right. uh, not quite since it started, but maybe uh, since it started, because I knew people in it. And specifically, I knew um, my college roommate from 1975. She moved into it later and has been living there for over 40 years now. So I've, I had visited and, and slept there as a guest. And um, I knew I'd help pick up garbage in the Macaulay neighborhood and things like that. So I, I did know about it. Um, I don't think it's in my perspective, it wasn't that much different than uh, just a roommate situation, because by the time I moved in, it was no longer, uh, I don't think that house is any longer a cooperative in terms of sharing lots of things, Rosalie and I did, but but I, I think it's, it's more um, um, a rented room situation, or in the other houses that they have, it's a rented, a flat uh, rented unit right. situation. Yeah, that, that's kind of how I experienced it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there is some community. I I came there during the pandemic first, and uh, that's not conducive to uh, community activities. Wasn't conducive. So, so I can't really say what the community was like. I've asked Rosalie about it, um, and they they did used to do more community things. I did was part of some community things, but very few, very few actually. If you're not on a committee. You don't actually interact with people who are part of the part yeah. of the, the cooperative. My experience was with it, I mean, was pre-pandemic. And it was that, I mean, there are community things, but it's very much you opt into it as a yes. in those situations. You know, yeah. there's a work party and like, but you have to be like, okay, I'm going to go to that. Um yeah. and yeah. or you could just live your life and, and do your own things, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. You so know. I did do some community things. I Rosalie and I um, scrubbed out a house, one of the other houses, in preparation for somebody else coming in. I, and I like that kind of thing. I like project-based uh, commu communal active, uh, work work bees, and uh, and that was fun. And I wouldn't have done that if it had not been a cooperative. So that's one feature of a cooperative is there's opportunities to contribute like that. Can you talk a little bit about co-housing? Co so I sort of had the same questions about co-housing. So did you kind of know what that was going to be like? And would you say that there are more opportunities to um, participate in community? Or what was sort of, how did you experience it? I think, as I said, co-housing is based on community first, and then physical space is, is next. It's it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around when you're coming from a society in which individual space is always put first and then community comes second. So we're all learning and it's an interesting learning curve, I think. But when you, I knew about co-housing because I knew people who started the Prairie Sky co-housing project in Calgary well over 20 years ago. So I was aware of the concept and I had also 
looked at the website of Urban Green, where I am now, where I, the, the co-housing project I bought into, but at, at some quite some years ago, but I wasn't uh, ready. Um, I wasn't in the time and the space and the, the, the life to think, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'd looked at it with interest, mm -hmm. but then I just forgot about it while I did other things. Going into it in 2021, I made the decision to buy in. And the first thing that happens is you don't, well, you might put down, I forget what the membership fee is. It's maybe a hundred dollars, like it's not much. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's not much. But what you do do immediately is interviews with people. You meet people. There's a, there's a social organized to meet people so that they get, people who are already in the project get a sense of who you are and you get a sense of who the people are. It's reciprocal. So with co-housing, you first meet the people and then you start to uh, start to um, make decisions about the physical space. Even though it was the pandemic and even though in 2021, I went back to Yellowknife, mm -hmm. I was uh, in touch with people by Zoom. So I got to know who everybody was before I actually ended up back in Edmonton and ready to move into it. I had already met people both in person and by zoom that's amazing so you yeah, it is. know your neighbors and you totally have... you know your neighbors and i contrast that with the condo so not a co-op co-op but a straight old condo situation you do not know the people who live above or below or beside you you right. can get to know them maybe and maybe you'll have a good relationship but maybe you won't but with co-housing you do know everybody who lives across below side and you work at having uh, not only a relationship with them but a good relationship with them a, a positive relationship with them and that's valuable we're not all angels you know and I'm sure there'll be people who get along better than others with other you know there's going to be there's going to be that but there is a stated and uh, true commitment to creating a positive community for everyone I had some questions about uh, what are some drawbacks to sort of the co-housing, communal housing, just in your experience that maybe not a lot of people talk about. I'm thinking, you know, like what if what if you do have a neighbor that you're that you don't really get along so well with or or something? To me, that's not a drawback uh, because you all have neighbors you don't get along with in every situation that you live in. Hmm. <laughs> it, it's that's not dependent on that's that has that is not unique to co-housing what is unique to co-housing is that you know the person and that there there are mechanisms for um resolving disputes and for uh working on what's best for the community together uh so i think the chances of you having a serious falling out with any of your neighbors are much, much lower than they would be in any other circumstance. What is a drawback, I think, uh, about co-housing, uh, and it's not a drawback, it's just the other side of a positive side. We're committed to consensual decision-making, which is good. Everybody, people get on board. We have mechanisms for that. It's not just a touchy-feely, everybody loves what we're doing sort of thing, but we have actual administrative processes for what we consider consensus. But that takes a long time. And I am a, hey, if we're going to if we're going to do it, let's do it kind of person. So I sometimes uh, get impatient with the slowness with which community decisions are are, um, are reached and then implemented. But I, that's really one of the only drawbacks that I can think of. Now, there are drawbacks to co-housing projects as such in the classic way of organizing co-housing projects. It's not a model that can be what do they call it that can be expanded you know that can mm. because of the nature of co-housing because people need to get together and then decide what kind of place they're going to build and then invest the money into that place before they're ever living there that that takes a long long time it takes a lot of money more money than a lot of people are able or willing to invest before they sell their house about 80% of co-housing projects that are kind of gleams in somebody's eye fail mm -hmm. at the stage where the first money needs to be put down. So people might meet enthusiastically for a couple of years. There's some people here in Edmonton that I know that did that. But then when, it, when, when you need to start really doing what you need to do in order to build the place, it, it's beyond 
both beyond the me- the means financially and beyond the means of people in their minds and their understanding of uh, how to reach the goal. I mean, all of that is just completely beyond me. I would not know the first thing about how to arrange the finances or even yes. the to sort of come yeah. there. Uh, I think there it's- are organizations that help you do that. Oh, yeah. So in Edmonton, the organization is, was, still is, Communitas. Okay. They worked actually with Inroads, where you and I lived. Um, yeah. they, they worked with them 45 years ago. So they've been around for a long, long time. And yeah. their goal, their mandate is to, to provide the administrative and legal assistance that projects need in order to get off the ground. Oh, and wow. there are organizations like that in, I, I don't know about all the provinces, but in Certainly in BC, there's there's organizations that that are, are good at that. And I would imagine Ontario and the Maritimes would have them as well. You don't have to do it all yourself. That's a real relief, actually. Yeah. That yeah. There is help out there, you know. Um, yeah. Very much an ideas person, not a being able to actually do the thing sort of person. Yeah. So having people to help out with that aspect of it is, is really For sure. That being said, if you're going to build a co-housing project, you do need people on in the group who have understanding of things. The greater variety of people you've got, the greater your breadth of understanding will be about the project that you're putting together. And I don't think co-housing projects can be built without a certain degree. The way co-housing is organized currently, I don't think projects can be built without having some, some individuals who do understand all the decisions that need to be made in order to build the project. It is important. Yeah. That leads a little bit into my next question, actually, um, where I was going to ask you if if you know if whether co-housing in Canada is unique to a certain type of person or group of people or age group of person. And so like I'm thinking like if it's all lawyers, you know, they're going to be really good at reading all the fine print, but, you know, like maybe there are some other aspects that. Oh, so good that at. would be really bad to have only lawyers, um, <laughs> just as it would be bad to have only, you know, German majors or German professors. Um, there's no question uh, that that would not be good. Let me just check for a second here. Uh, so the demographic um, every co housing project is different. Mm-hmm. So it's not possible to extrapolate and say this is the demographic that's attractive. If you look at a certain co-housing project in BC, Nelson, BC, there's two actually in Nelson, BC. And I think they there are more, uh, there's like an average of two children per unit, something like that. So fa- obviously families are attracted to that. And I think Nelson, BC would be a good a good place. Um, a, a, a logical place for there to be families attracted to 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 co-housing. The same would be true. Blueberry Commons in um, in on the island of Vancouver Island, uh, or no, the Sunshine Coast is also attracting, going to be attracting families because it contains a farm and oh. a, a work. It's five acres, and it's there's going to be blue, a blueberry farm on it. Is the intention, and y- you you can't have all lawyers, obviously, or you can't have all women who are 70 plus running it more than likely so every co-housing project will be different there is one in saskatoon which is which is um was built by and for seniors so they expressly uh, targeted that demographic so every co-housing project will be different ours urban green um has i think something like 10 to 12 children or minors who are between or younger people who are between uh, 15 months and university age. So there are families. But I would say the demographic does skew slightly towards o- older single females like myself mm. or or younger single females too who who just don't see that there's going to be a, as one, one young woman put it, there's not going to be a, a husband and two children and a dog and a picket fence in her future. And she sees this more as her future. But every project will be different. Very much so. It really depends on the project, where it's located, who the people were that originated it, uh, what the community is like. I'm just thinking like, because in in my experience with Inroads, it was, I mean, I wasn't the only university student in Inroads. 
And I found it very helpful as sort of a temporary university housing, whereas co-housing is a little bit more, you have to be very intentional about it. And you also have to put up money, which is not a thing that university students have. So yeah. I would imagine that that demographic is not super represented in uh, community housing. No, uh, no, they, the university students come along with their parents. Uh, it's not the university students. No, um, I think that co-op, Cooperative housing is talks first about finances. Mm -hmm. If you look at the websites of cooperatives, they talk about financing first. If you look at the websites of co-housing projects, they talk about community first. Mm -hmm. And oh. and it's 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 like it's inverse, really. So co-housing is not in the first instance intended to save you a great deal of money. It might in the long run. But it, that is not its first goal. Its first goal is to create a community where you will be part of the community. And so naturally you will, um, it will attract people for whom this is going to be a place they want to stay. They intend to stay for quite a long time. And people do stay for a long time. Occasionally somebody will buy in and realize it's not for them in the end. But um, most often, uh, it, as far as these kind of complexes, you know, the condo complex, we're in many ways a condo complex with a very large common area physically, but people will stay because they want the community, they want the location, they bought in intentionally and they are not going to move. Whereas in condos, often there's a fair bit of turnover. In cooperatives, I think there can be a fair bit of turnover as well because of the nature of, of, of it. I mean, speaking of, of communities and, and sort of chosen family and chosen communities, uh, since you just moved into Urban Green and you bought into that, um, I was wondering uh, sort of why did you decide on Urban Green specifically and uh, sort of what drew you to it? I'll, I'll put a link in the description for our listeners so they kind of yeah. get an idea of what it's like. Yeah. But uh, I'm interested in your specific experience. My husband died 13 years ago mm -hmm. and um, so I've been on my own uh, and I was on my own before that. So I understand living on my own and it can get lonesome. Although I'm a very social person, nevertheless. When he died, um, I decided I needed to do something different. And I ended up um, moving to Yellowknife from Calgary to Yellowknife. And I lived there for 10 years and I really value Yellowknife, still value Yellowknife. Great community, lovely little city, really adventurous. I did so many things there. It was uh, met people. I have really good friends. Friends are like family there. However, the pandemic hit. Mm. And when the pandemic hit, I realized the pandemic and the and the um, and the climate crisis kind of not that the, we didn't know about the climate crisis before, but it's like it intensified. Our knowledge has definitely intensified yeah. from, say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I realized that Yellowknife is really quite far from everything. Mm -hmm. It was far from from my son in particular, you know, just and we always one extra airport. And it was far from being able to drive somewhere. If I did want to drive somewhere, you always have to fly if you want to go somewhere from, or, or drive a vast, a really big dis distance. And also I thought I want to live 1500 kilometers closer to my food <laughs> because <laughs> there's no need for me to be up there really. So I looked around, where am I going to go? And I came, uh, I, I started to think about Edmonton as an alternative. And I thought about Edmonton in part because I thought, it will allow me to retain ties to Yellowknife because it is the gateway to the to the north, really. And I've had oodles of visitors already since since I've lived down here from Yellowknife. People on medical or people passing through, or especially with the uh, evacuation, I had people came and did laundry and you know that sort of thing. But when I was here in twenty, so I came in twenty one to test it out, and that's when I lived in uh, the room you had just vacated. I I was there for four months just to test out Edmonton, see what I thought, see how I felt. And I looked at a couple of different options. I looked at living permanently in Kabod in the Inroads Housing Co-op. And I realized after a week that that wasn't going to work mm. for all kinds of reasons. Then I looked at condos. I have a con I had a condo in Yellowknife. So I looked at condos. I looked at, for example, the Oliver area, which is a very nice, very nice area. It's fairly walkable. It's um, But what I thought about that was, okay, it would give me a, an anonymous box in a bigger anonymous box. I already have an anonymous box in Yellowknife. I have an anonymous box in an anonymous box mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily want to move to Edmonton for that. I'll be lonely, basically. Mm -hmm. Then I was looking around the old Strathcona area and I came to this, to the website of Urban Green. 
And I waffled a bit first because I thought, oh, these people, they sound so, they sound like they're beyond me socially, you know. I'm just this farm girl. I'm just this farm girl from Jarvis. <laughs> <laughs> but I sent the email. And after I had my first conversation with somebody, I realized this is going to be my tribe. These are these are going to be my people. And um, I made the decision almost instantaneously after my first contacts with the first few people that this it ticks so many boxes. It's it's in a wonderful area, the old Strathcona area. So it's totally walkable. It's a completely walkable area. You can access public transportation. I choose my activities in part by whether I can take a bus there or whether I can walk there or bike there. And for many things, I, I can do that. It has that gateway to the north aspect to it. I'm not responsible for everything. And that's wonderful. I'm co you know, I'm, I'm a helper. I'm, I'm part of it, but I'm not responsible for everything. And that too uh, makes me, makes me really happy. And I have a community. There's a built-in community and it feels, it feels less lonely as a result. I also took stock. I knew I didn't want to die in Yellowknife mm -hmm. for some reason. I thought I've, I'm the kind of person who thinks about death sometimes and plans for it because I'm, I'm aging and I'm not one of these people who says, Oh, I'm not aging. I am. <laughs> and so I planned for my older self. I knew that if I was going to move, I ought to do it while I was 70 or 60, 69, rather than waiting to when you're 80, because it gets harder to make friends and it gets, you don't have as much energy. You don't have the same kind of mind quite, you know, so better to do it now. So everything, all the boxes were ticked by Urban Green for me at this time. That's great. And so lucky that, you know, you were just searching around and, and found it. Yeah, awesome. I feel really lucky. I sort of got the only, there were a few units for sale, but uh, there was only one that for which I really, in a sense, qualified and for which which fit in with my finances and the size that I wanted there was a there was one that was smaller and there was one that was bigger and we were reserving we were reserving the bigger ones for families that was the intent and in fact it did happen we did get a family from Mikalowit who was living across the hall for me when I realized that unit was still available I said yes I'm gonna do it now I mean it would have been maybe maybe five years from now it would have also been a good thing but um, I realized co-housing is a very scarce commodity and if you decide you want to do it and you find a unit, buy it because it's scarce. It's not just scarce in terms of like physically, but also just in terms of part of the reason I wanted to do this interview was because co-housing is just not something that I knew about until about yeah. five years ago. And like I only really started looking into it in the past two years. And, you know, maybe my life would have been different if I'd known about it earlier, if I had been familiar with the concept earlier, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, same with cooperative housing, you know, like in my 20s, it would have been really great to sort of look into what the mm -hmm. cooperative housing scene was like where yeah. I was at the time. Um, but I just had no idea. And yeah. um, I just find that this is not something that a lot of people talk about, especially yeah. as a young person, you get the messaging in Canada that, you know, you, you have to buy a house, you yeah. know. Like it's yeah. like the, the, the ladder or the steps are, you know, you move out into student housing apartment, you get yeah. a slightly nicer apartment and then you save up and then you buy a house. And yeah. that's not exactly how life is going for people of my generation. So it is not. No. Um, Let me just um, talk a little bit about the mindset. You mentioned it uh, to a certain extent that, that as kids, university students uh, or whatever, you're, you're kind of the, the, the pattern is that you, you do high school, then you do for a while something while you're single, whether or not that be university or not, and then you get married and you buy your own house. I think it's interesting witnessing, looking at my understanding, my fellow co-housing residents, just how strong the social, I don't know, teaching or indoctrination or schooling, how, whatever word you want to use for it, is to think individually first. Yeah. You first think individually, this is mine. What's going to be mine? You know, this is going to be mine. Okay, I'm going to share this with you, but it's going to be mine. Mm -hmm. um, not that my fellow residents are all like that, but it's quite interesting to me, and I see it in myself, how we are all on this continuum between just individual, mm -hmm. what's yours, private property, and totally communal, which right. is, I suppose, what monasteries strive for. 
And I would say that we're all on somewhere on that continuum and it shows. And I think we are continually having to adjust our minds to what it is that we really do want to embark on, which is much more communal living than we have been doing. But the old habits die hard. Oh, uh, the old way of thinking, not the habits so much, but the old ways of thinking die hard. And mm -hmm. I find it fascinating to witness that, not just in my fellow uh, urban greeners, but definitely also in myself. Yeah. Um, so, and that's something to be thinking about if you're ever going to um, live in um, live in community. And just, you know, how how, how indoctrinated are you in, in not living in community, you know, and... and I mean, that's such an interesting perspective and um, such an interesting observation to make. I mean, um, that narrative that we all sort of unconsciously live in, that sort of um, being individualistic is sort of the way to be a human, you know, and it's like, well, no, actually, there are different ways. Um, yeah. But we need to first be able to think a different way before we can act a different way. Yeah. And could I say that um, that legislation and policies in society are also not conducive to facilitating this kind of thing? So our corporate in in Edmonton, in Alberta, it's not Edmonton; it's an Alberta thing. In Alberta, we uh, projects like our, ours are governed by two sets of policies. Each of them, I don't know, like eighty pages long or whatever government policies. One is the Condo Act, but the other one is the Cooperatives Act. So we are two things. We are we are we're individual condos like any old individual condos, and we are cooperatives like I don't know the grocery store is the the co-op grocery store is. So society societal structures have not caught up with mm. trying to do things communally yet. Okay, interesting. Which is also something to be aware of and to be to be yeah to, to yeah. know you have to work with it. Yeah, to realize that sometimes it's not it's not you, it's that you're running up the, against these structures of yeah. not only structures of the way, you know, like like physical structures, but structures of thought almost yes. that yeah. that make it so that people or corporations can't really think outside of that box. Yeah. Is, yeah. So frustrating, but yeah, it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Okay, so that was primarily it there. Let me let me say this though um, about co communal housing. Uh, let's, let's instead of calling, let's let's just put co housing aside for a minute and talk about communal housing. I've certainly always contemplated communal housing. Um, I remember when we lived in Winnipeg, which would have been 50, 60 years, fifty years ago, no, forty. I remember fantasizing about potentially buying an apartment building. And a small one, three-story walk-up kind of thing, and having one unit be available, turn that into a common space, and have the others, however, uh, bought by different people, but by people that you knew. I grew up on the farm in what might be called a communal house because my grandparents lived with us, ah, and yeah. I've talked to a number of people in through my life, in, currently one in fact as well, who have both. Uh, a parents living with them and children living with them and sometimes grandchildren living with them. That too is a form of communal housing. There is a organization in BC that I recommend highly if you want to explore communal housing, which is, which is of all types, mm -hmm. which looks at communal housing broad, very broadly and provides legal, financial, social, psychological, re real estate advice or thoughts or guidance on how to think about all these different forms. And they're called co-housing, coho BC. So if you look up co capital C, small O, large H, capital O, capital H, small O, BC. They have great uh, little web videos, et cetera, on their, um, on their website. And um, I've listened to a few of their webinars and found them right on the money if you are thinking about living communally in some way without necessarily going the co-housing route. I am so glad that there are these supports out there because, yeah. I mean, when you just sort of stumble across the idea as a single person, you're kind of like, I, is there anybody else talking about this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People do talk about it. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think that this, uh, 
this coho BC has coalesced because people do talk about it, but they just don't know how to go about it. And there's lots of things to to think about when you do it. Right. Back in the 70s, 60s, you know, the hippie 60s and 70s, people would have communes. Mm -hmm. Most of them failed. Why? Because there was a great deal of idealism about living together and no structure to facilitate all the different human beings who would be part of the project and and probably disastrously, you know, not do their share of the work or uh, <laughs> good, goodness knows what, you know. And I think this is the the modern shaping of that desire to live communally in some way. And Coho BC, I, I love because they have a broader vision of what that can look like and hence more realistic. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And they, I'm sure that they're more, way more up to date on, you know, like what sort of questions to ask and what yes. the government grants there are and, yeah. and what are the anticipated issues and yeah. all that. They also, they only started in, I think, 2017 or 2018 or 2019, just, just pre pandemic. So, so you can see this is cut, kind of forefront cutting edge yeah. way of starting to think about things. I think a lot of people are starting to sort of think about housing alternatives, mm -hmm. especially since the housing market pretty much across yeah. Canada is terrible right now. Um, people are starting to say, well, what are my alternatives? Yeah. But then also, I think one of the things that's really plaguing our society nowadays is is just feeling lonely. <laughs> and yeah. it's cut off from, yeah. from that sense of community. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Realizing that, yeah, community is something that you have to be intentional about. It doesn't yeah. just happen. You no just happen. longer just assume that your neighborhood is going to have some sort of community events. They have to be the people who like actually go out and do it. And mm -hmm. it's very important to be intentional about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And of course, we're all super busy and we don't have time for that. Yeah. And so, but if you're living in a place where, you know, like that's the stated intention, it's just sort of built into the fabric of it is. Yeah. That's amazing. So the other day, just as a small, small example, the other day, our building is still in the process of being finished. So there's lots to do. And I volunteered to put up signs on the fourth floor that are needed for the city inspection. And I went down to the office to pick up those signs. And as I was looking through them, somebody else stuck her head in and said, mm -hmm. hello, and chatted. I said, oh, do you want to, hey, do you have, have you got time to help me put up those signs? Sure, she said. So the two of us ended up putting up a signs. Now that's very small. It took us 20 minutes or something like that. But interactions like that um, kind of are enough to sustain a person for a day or a couple of days, you know. Um, it's that kind of happenstance interaction that really builds community and makes you feel like you're part of community. It doesn't need to be big. It can be quite small and it's very valuable. Yeah, and sort of that result of the, all those sort of small cumulative interactions, just it builds right. and builds. And, yeah. Oh, that sounds so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and may I say as a bonus, um, my late husband used to say, risks deserve rewards. And that was a little mantra between us. Taking the risk to move to Edmonton, buy into Urban Green, and this isn't so much Urban Green, but just simply taking the risk of doing something different my son and his, my daughter-in-law and my granddaughter have just moved to Calgary. So I have the additional advantage since living in Edmonton that I can go easily go see them. So that's just such a bonus to having made the decision to move here. I had one last question about whether the timing of this decision is significant. And you did already mention COVID and, you know, like, and also the sort of we I feel like we kind of talked about that a little bit but did you have anything to add well let me just it maybe just as a summary or just a focus on why the timing was significant I think it had to do with my age mm. that I wanted to settle somewhere and be settled and have a place where I would want be want to stay want to stay for the rest of my life in a sense I've said to people I I'm not moving again I'm I want to be carried out of here in a pine box but the climate crisis was another one Mm -hmm. I wanted to live with a smaller footprint and the newer, the newer, certainly um, co-housing projects also work on a smaller footprint. Um, not everybody needs to have this or that because you share things. We already are seeing that. Uh, does anybody have a, uh, I don't know, whatever, applesauce maker? Oh yeah, I've got one. You can use mine. You know, you don't have to rush out and buy one. It was also significant because I wanted to reduce 
my carbon footprint geographically. Mm. Now, that's got two edges. Edmonton is a bigger city and you can't always get where you want to go without driving, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, nevertheless, there's certain other things that I I can buy local produce year round because it gets produced here. I can walk places. Um, so carbon footprint was another biggie. Right. And then moving to where I knew my neighbors. As part of the aging process, I wanted to live somewhere where I could settle and know people. That's, I mean, that's very comforting too, you know, like you feel like you have, you have an agency and control over where you have decided to go and what you decide to buy. And then also agency and control over where you live and sort of who you interact with on a daily basis. Yeah. Lovely. That's right. yeah. And that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a luxury, not a luxury, but I know a lot of people don't have that. They haven't either set up their lives that way or their lives haven't gone in that direction. So I didn't want to be one of those people. Well, thank you so much, Armina, for your words of wisdom and for sharing your experience on the podcast today. I feel like I personally learned a lot. And I think I speak for our listeners when I say that this is a truly generative discussion. And we're, I mean, I'm going away now with a lot of ideas of things that I want to research. <laughs> Good. <laughs> It's a pleasure. Thank you for uh, being interested. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I look forward to hearing more from you about uh, urban green in the future, maybe. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Solar Punk Presence, a podcast hosted and produced by Ariel Kroon and Christina De La Rocha. The audio for this episode was recorded in part on the traditional territory of the neutral Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And in Germany. The opening and closing music for this podcast is Water Cooler Gang by Monkey Warhol, available for use under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Don't forget to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash solarpunkpresence. Every little bit helps us keep bringing you discussions and interviews. Until the next episode, keep dreaming. And stay solar punk. <laughs>